So we're going to continue looking at um, you know how we apply second order effects to um, to, to structure and um, you know just to recap when we've looked at um, you know how do we you know what are second order effects they're all, they're going to be uh, yeah, additional deformations and moments um, and shear forces which are going to get uh, generated because of deformations in your structure from your first order action. So like your first order actions in this example um, are going to be the uh, the loads which are applied uh, to the columns and then you know if we had any uh, any shear or or, um, uh, or, or bending moment uh, bending moment demands uh, it, it's all the deformations which occur from from that. So uh, we're going to look at this example here uh, which is this uh, sort of small frame. Uh, we're only going to look uh, in, in sort of this direction here. So this is, uh, in, you know, the brief says that it's a sway system. Uh, we have uh, a little bit of information about uh, the relative stiffness of our columns and our beams. Uh, so our column is 25% uh, uh, stiffer than our, uh, our beams. Our beams are a 460 UB by 82. Uh, so you can see what the uh, moment of inertia in the X is. And so what we need to do is we need to determine um, what our sway multiplier is. And again, all this sway multiplier is is that if we have um, some moderate level um, second order effects, then the sway multiplier is essentially uh, just, uh, you know, we, we can then multiply what our first order actions are uh, by that, and it's a, it's a simplified way uh, to deal with these uh, second order effects, which are inherently a nonlinear problem. Now, if you remember, if we have a really, uh, you know, really large deformations, uh, we're very close to our critical buckling loads on these columns, well, then we need to do a specific second order analysis. Um, and if we are, uh, if we have a lot more capacity uh, for compression um, than what our um, you know, critical buckling load is, uh, then we can sort of safely ignore these second order effects. So I, I keep throwing these uh, these terms out. So what do I mean by, um, you know, our, our uh, critical buckling load and the like? So with, with the second order effects, uh, if you remember, we're really down to looking at determining this uh, elastic buckling load. Elastic buckling factor uh, lambda c, and it's really this um, lambda c, uh, which is the thing which tells us if we are going to be, um, you know, needing to, uh, you know, account for these, uh, you know, buckling, uh, these second order effects or not. So, you know, what is this lambda c? So, um, lambda c is is the you know we'll we'll keep a reference column um, over here on the right hand side just uh, so we know where these um, equations are coming from. So, if we look at NZS three four zero four, um, and then if we go into section. 4.9.2.2.2 and 4.9.2.2.3. Uh, what we see is this lambda c equals our nominal buckling load over our um, uh, our applied load, and um, if we, uh, you know, this is for a brace system. And then if we have a sway system, uh, lambda c equals the sum of the uh, nominal buckling load uh, over the L over the sum of our n star over the L for 1 story. 
and this is for sway. So, um, you know, what, okay, that's as uh, useful. And again, if we, we look back at what does this mean, uh, this is a ratio between our, uh, our buckling, uh, our, basically our Euler buckling uh, load to our, um, to our demand. And this is similar uh, for a sway, but instead of doing it member by member like we do in a brace system, uh, we do it with a, uh, you know, we sum up this ratio for the entire story. And this, uh, you know, N-O-M-B or N-M-O-S, um, N-O-M, we'll just B slash S, is really uh, just going to look like our Euler buckling equation. So pi squared E-I divided by K-E-L. And that's just uh, straight out of 4.8.2. And so the only thing that's really going to change uh, between our brace system and our sway system is this KE factor. And this KE, um, if, uh, if it's a brace system, it will be less, less than or equal to 1. Um, and if it's a sway system, KE will be uh, greater than 1. Wouldn't that make sense? You know, if it's a sway system, it's more likely to buckle. And so the, uh, the you know, compression load, which that happens, is going to be lower. So the denominator has to get bigger. So all of that makes sense uh, sort of from a, a mathematics standpoint. Um, and what we've looked at, you know, previously is, is using, um, you know, some idealized boundary conditions for this KE. So if we uh, say we have a frame, uh, you know, we, you know, down at the ground, we're, we're something, you know, we're fixed, but, you know, we've got some rotation. This is not going to have zero rotation in a real structure. And then say the joints at the top, um, you know, they're, they're not fixed and they're not quite pinned. They're somewhere in between. And so if we look at, you know, say this column here, uh, really what we have is sort of some you know, rotational spring at the top and some rotational spring at the bottom with a stiffness of I column. <clears throat> well, if we, you know, this rotational spring will have some uh, rotation uh, gamma at the top and some rotation uh, gamma at the bottom. And we can use these two to determine what our KE is uh, with some more, you know, realistic, um, you know, rotational stiffnesses. So that's the first thing we're going to do um, in order to, you know, because ultimately what we're looking at is what this lambda C factor is and, and where it is uh, in, you know, basically where this ratio sits and whether with this, uh, this ratio here will determine uh, sort of what our, uh, our, our second order effects are going to be. Uh, but to get there, we need to know uh, what this nominal buckling load is, and we need to know Ke. So, uh, starting off, let's just uh, let's start determining uh, the Ke for this uh, first story. So, determining. Case of E for first story columns. So <clears throat> we have a um, we have a symmetric uh, frame here. So we really only need to determine uh, you know two of these because you know the columns on on grid line A and grid line C are, are going to have sort of identical but you know uh, mirrored boundary conditions. So uh, let's start with with those first. So you know column A C uh, one. Um, well, the first thing we need to look at is our uh, gamma at our top, and if we um, if we go into our uh, our design uh, standard, what we'll find is that if we want to determine what this gamma is, 
uh, we need to look at, well, what is the, what we're going to do is we're going to sum up uh, basically the stiffness of each um, column that frames into a particular joint uh, and then divide that by the stiffness of each beam. And then we have this beta E factor here, um, which is, you know, what the, the other end of the um, system is looking like. So um, just to have a quick look at this, uh, and, so, and then if we have a, um, uh, if we have a member, or if we have a, an end which is, uh, you know, fixed, well, then we take a gamma, uh, sorry, if we have a member which is uh, pinned, uh, we take a gamma of 10. And if we have a, a member which is uh, fixed, uh, we use uh, you know, 0.6 as our gamma. So coming back, let's, uh, let's just work in, um, you know, what this uh, gamma is at the top. We'll do a C. Uh, well, we've got you know, two columns coming in, and that's going to be I column divided by L column, and then that's divided by, well, this joint only has one beam, so we're going to have beta E times I beam divided by L beam. So this beta E factor, let's, uh, let's go over uh, to our standard and see what that looks like. So we're in a, uh, in a sway system, so we're going to be uh, working in, uh, you know, in this column um, over here. And we have a few options you know, of what our other end looks like. Is it pinned? Is it rigidly connected to a column? Or is it fixed? Well, we're in a we're in a sway system um, with you know this is a, a moment resisting frame, so we're we're not pinned, so that one's out. So um, we're either going to be uh, zero point well, one point zero or zero point six seven. So in order to be um, fixed, uh, we essentially have to you know kind of be buried into concrete. You know what, what we are and what you you tend to get. Uh, when you have these sway systems is that the far end is rigidly connected to a column. Um, so um, that's going to be, we're going to use this beta E factor of 1.0. Um, so coming back to our calculations, uh, let's plug some stuff in. Well, we know that uh, I column is just 25% uh, larger than uh, the beam uh, from our project brief. So uh, what we end up with is 2 times 1.25 I of the beam. Um, and that's going to be all divided by 4. And then we have beta E equals 1.0 times the beam moment of inertia uh, divided by the length of the beam, uh, which is nine meters here. So, and you say you get the four meters for the uh, height of the column. So if we work all of this out, uh, what we end up with is gamma AC top, and we'll say AC1 for the, uh, the first story. Uh, if we work all of this out, we get 5.63. And then because the bottom is fixed, um, we know that uh, gamma AC um, bottom equals 0 0.6. And um, let's just, you know, throw in you know, beta E. We'll just do some references here uh, quickly. It's just going to be table 4.8.3.4. Uh, in fact, I'm going to move this uh, uh, alpha C over. I, I don't like it crowded over there. It looks a little bit messy. Uh, makes the, our calculations a little bit hard to read. So we'll just go back here. Uh, gamma AC bottom AC1 
equals 0 0.6. So in order to find this, um, you know, again, what the whole purpose of this was to find out what our um, effective length is. Well, in order to do this, if we have a gamma at the top and a gamma at the bottom, uh, we need to go back into our um, uh, into our standard and look up uh, this pay, uh, you know, our figure uh, 4.8.3.3 and what we're doing here is we're looking at you know what our stiffness ratio is uh, at each end and so uh, because we have uh, one which is at 5.6 and one which is at 0 0.6 uh, what we do is um, we come to uh, you know 0 0.6 uh, at one end, and you know, keep in mind this is a, a logarithmic scale, and then we follow this line up until we hit um, about 5.6, so somewhere up in here, and you can see we're between um, uh, sort of one point, um, so we're about 5.6, uh, we're actually probably just above here. So we're somewhere, you know, above 1.6 and below 1.8. So we're going to call that uh, 1.65. Um, yeah, as, as you can see, it, it's uh, uh, the interpolation here is uh, it's up to a, uh, you know, a, you know, some judgment. But you can see well, we're about 1.65, and I think that's a a fairly uh, you know useful um, you know case of E. So we'll have case of E equals 1.65. And this is just coming from figure 4.8.3.3. All right, well, we figured out our case of E for uh, two of the columns. Let's figure it out for uh, this middle column here. So it's bringing that. Um, page up here. Uh, we want, you know, grid line. B uh, in our first story. So, gamma B1 top two columns, so we've got the two columns framing in, and we have two beams framing in into this joint. So uh, we'll do two I column divided by L column, and all of that is going to be over, as I said, we have two beams coming in, two I BM times beta E over L BM. This beta E, again, we're just going to be rigidly connected to a column. Uh, so we have a beta E of 1. And uh, we know the, the ratio between our IBM and our I column is 1.25 uh, from our project brief. And again, this is would be, if you're designing the structure, uh, it would be uh, an initial guess you would have. You know, you would say, ah, well, let's try this I column 1.25 time. So say that you've already sized your beam here for your uh, your floor loads coming in and you want to you know make us make a start at a guess of what column size we need. Well we need to guess um, some size in order to get a um, uh, um, a stiffness uh, here. So um, coming back over and again we will just start our, our reference column over here. So 2i column over L column, uh, and then 2ibm or BE over LBE uh, gives us 2 times 1.25 times I beam over uh, 4 meters tall uh, divided by 2 times IBM uh, times 1.0 over 9. And so we have gamma B1 
top, uh, if we work out this ratio, what we end up with is 2.81. So let's just take a, a quick moment to sort of uh, pause and ponder on this. We have a gamma, which is uh, if 2.81, uh, which is, you know, not quite half of what we had our, uh, our stiffness, uh, you know, previously from our... Um, you know, from, you know, at, at this joint here. You know, it's always good to think when we do these calculations, does that make sense? Well, if we know that a, uh, a fixed end uh, is a zero, as a gamma, a stiffness ratio of 0 0.6, uh, and a fixed, and a free end has one of, um, of 10, well, I mean, that kind of makes some sense where, you know, as we add in more members, uh, our stiffness ratio goes down, it gets closer and closer to fixed. And so, yeah, that should, uh, that seems actually quite reasonable there that we would have a, um, that we would start coming down uh, in, in the stiffness ratio. So that's, that's always good uh, to see that. And again, always just these, these little things just to, to double check uh, that our answers are sensible as we uh, go through here. So uh, then if we look at B1, uh, bottom. Uh, again, we have a, uh, a fixed connection here, so we know our gamma equals uh, 0 0.6. And so, well, now it's time to go uh, back to our figure and, uh, and try to determine a, um, a stiffness ratio. So, uh, we'll come back up here to our our figure, so we have a, again, we're looking at sort of 0 0.6. Um, see if I can even just, I uh, can't quite highlight that for us. But so we're gonna be up here 0 0.6, and then we wanna come down to about, uh, what was it, 2.81. So that's 0 0.3, this is 2.5, 2.81. It's gonna be yeah, somewhere between 1.4 and 1.5, so uh, we're just going to call that uh, 1.48. So, case of E, uh, E1 equals 1.48. Uh, and again, this is just coming off of figure 4.8.1. Three. All right, well, we, we now have the um, stiffness, well, we have the effective lengths for all of the columns on the bottom level. Uh, we need to do them for the top level now. So, grid line, A, C, second, story. And if we do that, well, we've got, we'll start with our gamma, AC2, uh, top, and that's just going to be um, I column over L column. So, you know, we're looking at this joint up here. We just have the uh, one column framing in and the, um, uh, the one beam framing in. So... Uh, looking at that again, so I column, L column over IBM beta E L beam. So if we do that, well, then we're going to end up with 1.25 I beam over 4 divided by I beam times 1.0 divided by 9. 
And if we go ahead and work all of that out, what we'd see is we have a gamma AC2 top equals 2.81. And then we already know what our stiffness is at the bottom because it was... Uh, the bottom stiffness for the second story is the top stiffness for the first story. So uh, just pulling that here, we see that AC1 top is just going to be uh, AC2 bottom, so 5.63. So we go gamma AC2 bottom equals 5.63. Well, then if we work out our uh, KEAC2 uh, KCAC2, we don't need any, any top there. It's the second story. We know it's the top. KCA2, uh, again, we'll just uh, kick back over to our, um, our frame here. So... Uh, this is our, our braced one. We've come back here. So we've got a um, 5.6 and a 2.81. So uh, we'll come up to our 3 and then come over. Well, this is our 2.5. And, um, and then up to about 5 and a 6. Uh, that's going to be, uh, we'll be somewhere around here. We're going to be just shy of it and so uh, let's just say we'll just call it a, uh, a case of E of 1.9 all right and then uh, let's look at grid line B in the second story. So we'll look at gamma B2 top. Well, it's just going to have uh, one column and two beams coming into it, so our stiffness ratio is just going to be I column over L column uh, divided by 2 times I beam beta E over L beam. And that's going to give us a 1.25 I beam over 4 divided by 2 I beam times 1.0 over 9. Uh, well, this will just, uh, and again, this is sort of, um, you know, or we're going to divide, uh, or we've got about twice as many beams coming in here as we did on the second story, so uh, we should actually see this to be uh, about half, and that's if we work it out, that's exactly what we get. We get gamma B to top equals 1.41. And then uh, gamma uh, B2 bottom uh, is just going to equal our, uh, our top from the story below because uh, it's the same joint. And so that's going to be 2.81. Um, and then if we go back uh, to our... Uh, our figure here, we've got 2.81, and then something about uh, 1.4. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be about 1.6. So um, coming back, we'll just say Ke B2 equals 1.6. And again, figure 
figure 4.8.3.3. All right, well, now that we have all of our, our KE factors, well, we can go through and we can work out what this um, you know nominal buckling capacity is because, well, we have pi, and we have E, we have I, and now we have KE and L. So we can work out what this is. Uh, you know, if we're looking at our sway system, we need to work it out for uh, an entire story um, and then divide by uh, the length of the columns. Um, and then the big thing here is that we're going to use the actual length. We're not going to use the effective length here. And that's because uh, we've already accounted for the effective length in the nominal buckling capacity. So uh, if we put it in here, we're, we would sort of be double counting it. All right, so uh, first thing what we're going to do is just look at uh, the nominal buckling loads for the first story. Uh, then we'll compute them for the second story, and then we can look at this uh, lambda c uh, factor. So let's just uh, work through that. So uh, the uh, nominal buckling loads first story so we have the um, uh, noms AC1 pi squared EI over KEL and again this is going to be NZ S3404 uh, in section 4.8.2 uh, and our KE is just going to come from you know page 1 KE and just for completeness let's just uh, finish our our uh, reference here uh, so uh, this gives us you know pi squared times 200,000 um, our I is 372 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth so we'll do uh, 376 times 10 to the sixth our KE value uh, is 1.65 so we have uh, 1.65 times uh, 4 meters or 4,000 uh, millimeters and um, let's just divide all of this by uh, 1,000 uh, you know, newtons per kilonewton uh, just to get us into kilonewtons. So if we work all of that out, what we find is um, noms AC1 equals 21,000. 770 kilonewtons which I mean you know if we stop and think about it that's a massive buckling load um, and it's and you know, for for this column it's just it's it's, it's crazy high um, you know the big reason is because the uh, you know we have a, a relatively large um, moment of inertia about this axis and uh, you know a relatively short, um, you know, unbraced length. Um, even even with our KE factor 1.65, it's still you know relatively small. All right, so um, it I guess it, it's time to have a look at what this is for our uh, our middle column. So I'm gonna do noms B1 pi squared EI over K, L, sorry, I'm missing a few things uh, and transposing from my notes, uh, K, E squared. In fact, I've got that sort of uh, messed up from the beginning. So that's a, you know, an L squared term there. So, uh, you know, apologies for, uh, for that one. All right. So uh, if we you know kick this back through uh, ke squared, uh, we get pi squared 
200,000. 370, yep, 72 times 10 to the 6th over our KE for uh, B. Um, if we look, that's, uh, you know, 1.48. For eight times four thousand, we'll square that, and then again we'll divide by a thousand uh, newtons per kilonewton. And we got page two equals ke. Uh, we work all of this out. We have noms b one is going to be equal to. 26,770 kilonewtons. So that, that that's a, you know, a rather large thing. And, you know, I've just realized a mistake here uh, for those who, who've been astute and uh, looking at the notes. This was, we're looking at the I calm. Uh, this should be uh, a 1.25 factor here, so yeah, just a a little bit of a mistake as I'm as I'm transposing notes over. So yeah, that, that happens sometimes. But uh, there we go. So uh, we've worked them out for the first story. Uh, time to work out the nominal bucking load for the second story. And so if we do that, we have um, nom AC second equals pi squared EI over KEL squared. Uh, we're going to end up with pi squared times 200,000 times 1.25 times 372 times 10 to the 6th. And then our um, case of E value for our uh, AC on the top is going to be 1.9. So we have 1.9 times 4,000 squared. Uh, and again, we'll divide by 1,000. And um, all of that uh, works out to a nom AC2 uh, equals 15,000. 890 kilonewtons and then nom B2 pi squared EI KEL squared equals pi squared times 200,000 times 1.25 uh, times 372 times 10 to the 6. And again, just a reminder, this is what our, uh, you know, from our brief, what our, um, our column is going to be 1.25 uh, times that um, over uh, KE uh, for B2, uh, we found was 1.6. So we have 1.6 times 4,000, all of that squared, uh, divide by 1,000. And then this is all, you know, page 2 equals KE. 
page two equals case of E. Um, if we crunch the numbers on this one, we get a uh, nominal buckling capacity at B2 equal to 22,410. Kilonewtons. So uh, again, it's probably it's always good to sort of stop and think. You know, do these numbers make sense? Um, and what we what we kind of see is that at the um, the bottom story we have a higher buckling capacity than we do uh, at the top story, and in the middle columns we have a higher buckling capacity uh, than we do on the external. Well, uh, again, this should all make sense based upon the. Uh, KE factors that we're getting, but let's look at what all of this means uh, physically. So at the bottom story, uh, because the bottom of the column is fixed and we have this really low rotation, well, this is, you know, if you can think normally, this is kind of like a fixed pin or closer to a fixed pin uh, where, you know, we've got a, a buckling factor of about, you know, 0.7. Uh, while up here we're sort of uh, a buckling factor of sort of one for uh, effective length factor, sorry, not buckling factor, effective length factor. So we would expect, you know, because we're, we're more rigid uh, at the bottom story, we're going to have, uh, you know, less, you know, rotation. So we're not going to have the same amount of out of plane deformation. Uh, and so we will have a higher buckling capacity, uh, which is sort of what we see where the, you know, the bottom story is higher than the, the top story. Also, the middle column uh, has a higher buckling, uh, nominal buckling load uh, than the exterior columns. And again, that makes sense because we have these uh, two beams uh, which are providing restraint uh, to this top, while on the external, uh, we only have the one beam. And then if we look, you know, this, uh, this joint, well, this column here, uh, the top story uh, external, has only one column, one beam, um, uh, resisting it, and so that's why we would see, yeah, this, we would, as we would expect, it will have the uh, the lowest uh, nominal buckling load. So this one, because it is uh, less restrained, it's going to buckle earlier than all of the others. All right, so now that we have um, our, our nominal buckling load, well, we can work out what this uh, elastic buckling factor was. You know, all well, way back when, you know, if we remember, this was uh, this is sort of the key uh, for our uh, effective length factor to determine, you know, how close is this ratio between the load which we've applied and, uh, you know, the load at which we're, we're going to see onset of buckling. So if we go, you know, lambda C, the elastic buckling load. factor, well, for a sway system, lambda c equals lambda ms, and that equals the sum of noms over L divided by the sum of n star over L, and again, this is coming from NZS 3404 in section 4.9.2.3.2. All right, well, let's look at the second story first. So if we look at the second story, We get a lambda ms equal to, well, noms. Uh, it's going to be 15,890. Uh, so two of those and then one of the uh, 22 of the four. Uh, length of the column. Again, we're using the actual length. We're not using the effective length. If we use the effective length, if the effective length is already accounted for in the noms. So uh, we'd be double counting it. If we put it in, so big one, this is the, you know, uh, actual length of column. 
So lambda ms equals 15, 8, 90 over 4 plus 22, 410 over 4 plus, um, and then for column C, same as column A, 15, 8, 90 over 4. And then, you know, for the end star, well, we've got uh, 1335 and 2556. So let's uh, put those ratios in there. So we have 1335 over 4 plus 2556 over 4 plus 1335 over 4. Lambda ms equals lambda c equals 10.4. So um, that's our first one. Let's now let's look at what our second one is because our, it's going to be our our lowest buckling load factor is going to be the thing which uh, governs, and that, that kind of makes sense because the lowest buckling load factor, if this is a fixed value. Um, it's really, you know, the, the lowest lambda C is going to be the one which has the closest, um, where the applied load is closest to what the uh, buckling load factor is. So, looking at the uh, lambda C in the first story, uh, we got lambda ms, lambda C equals lambda ms for a sway system, uh, and that's going to be, um, again, pull out, we've got 21,770 and 26,770 as our nominal buckling loads for the uh, the three columns. So uh, 21,770 over a 4-meter column plus uh, 26,770 over 4 meters plus 21. 770 over 4, and that's all going to be divided by uh, columns A and C have a, have a load of 2,005 kilonewtons, and column B has one of 3,672. So uh, we'd have a 2,005, 2,005 over 4, over 4, uh, plus... 3,672 over 4. So if we crunch the numbers here, uh, we get uh, lambda ms1 equals 9.15. So uh, if we look again, we'll just sort of, we'll write you know, lambda c second story. Uh, equals 10.4 and lambda C first story equals 9.15. Well, the smaller lambda C, again, it's the, the one which is where we're closest to our buckling load, uh, the smaller lambda C is the one that governs. So, uh, you know, it's got this value of uh, 9.15. Well, what, is, what does that really even mean? Well, uh, it's, you know, always good to kind of come back to our, um, uh, in, into our, uh, our standard here, and so if we do that, uh, you know, let's take just a moment. Yeah, and so if we if we take a look at what you know what this means, well, um, the standard will say if we have this uh, you know bucking load ratio greater than ten, um, you know, obviously this is the one that governs. But you know, let's let's have a look at what this means at, at uh, ten. Um, if it's greater than ten, we can ignore are second order effects. And again, thinking about what that means physically, it means that 
our applied load is only one tenth of so a ten percent of what it, the load it take to buckle it. So we're going to have really really small deformations, uh, first order deformations, and so the second order effects are are negligible. Um, if we're less than that, but you know, we're, if so, if we have a, a lambda c less than ten, but greater than three point five, well, then we're just going to uh, amplify our uh, our buckling moment uh, according to uh, the standard here. So we're going to uh, find what our uh, our factor uh, d sub s is, and it's simply just going to be. And this again, we're looking at a, a non-earthquake load one here. Um, it's just going to be 0 0.95 divided by 1 over 1 lambda c. Uh, and it's, it's got to be greater than or equal to 1.0. So uh, let's just work that out really quick. Uh, delta s equals 0 0.95 over 1 minus 1 over lambda c. Uh, that's just going to be 0 0.95 over 1 minus 1 over 9.15. Work all of that out, we get a delta S equals 1.07. So uh, what all of this uh, you know, really sort of comes down to is that um, we're going to, uh, to amplify our, uh, you know, whatever our first order moments are here uh, by a factor of about, you know, an increase of about 7%, 1.07. Now, uh, the, the one thing that we aren't doing on this um, example is that uh, for the standard, if you have a sway system, you need to check both the sway multipliers and uh, the brace multipliers, but you can only check the brace multipliers if you understand what your um, uh, transverse uh, loads are. And because those aren't given in this example, uh, you're not going to be able to to work through those. So um, that's this. So we have. Uh, so all we're going to have is this uh, delta s of uh, uh, 1.07. And so here we'll I'll even just write that little note. You know, note. Um, also need to check delta B, C, if it is larger than delta S. Uh, but don't have, uh, you know, moment information to calculate. Seats of M. Uh, because, you know, we've got delta B equals C of M, 1 minus 1 over lambda C. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're and you know, as I said, we, uh, we would need to check this if we were, if we were uh, actually uh, applying this, but, um, you know, uh, just for the sake of this example, uh, the example sort of uh, long enough as it is, uh, we're only just going to look at this uh, delta s. So, um, uh, as uh, as uh, what I hope you see is that it's it's not a terribly uh, difficult um, calculation for for computing the second order. Um, effects. It is a little bit uh, long and tedious. I mean, we, we took our time sort of just showing where each of these uh, little pieces uh, comes from. But um, yeah, so again, the, the main factor that we're looking at here is this elastic buckling factor, and, and it's determining how close your applied load is uh, to, your, uh, to your nominal buckling load. Uh, and then based upon this, 
uh, we can you know sort of you know bump up our first order moments uh, accordingly. So uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, you know thanks for watching.